We're going to continue our study in the Sermon on the Mount. If you don't mind standing with me, I want to read together verse 7. Uh, the, the fifth of the eight Beatitudes were really right at the heart, the core of the center of the message. And I think that this particular part of the Sermon on the Mount, of the Beatitudes, is pivotal. It simply reads, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Let's pray. Father, I ask as we begin to look at this statement that you made so long ago that you would help us to really begin to comprehend what it's saying. As I've struggled over this passage this last week, it just has impressed upon me how much deeper this issue goes than I had ever anticipated. So Lord, open our hearts, open our eyes and our ears and our understanding so that Lord, we could really begin to grow in this idea of being merciful people. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know, today's world is full of shortcuts, strategies, formulas, all promising the instantaneous success, uh, maximum visibility, and viral popularity. But I want to warn you that if you set out to live out the Beatitudes that we've been studying, you will not accomplish any of those things. You will not become successful or visible or popular necessarily. If it does, it's going to be a complete accident and surprise. Because the Beatitudes aren't any kind of formula. They're a, a long, steep, narrow road that leads to life, but a life that's vastly different than the one many people are striving to attain. You're more likely to struggle and to be ignored than you are to be popular and praised if you live out these things. And this is why the Beatitudes kind of read strangely to us. I mean, they feel unrelated to the world that we live in, that kind of like some kind of vestigial, vestigial organ from another time or another place. But still, Jesus clearly meant for them to be lived out in this world, in the here and now of our everyday life. Admittedly, the origins of the Beatitudes is not this world. They come from another, greater reality than the one we're in, a reality that's outside, above and beyond anything that we experience in this flawed and fallen world of sinful humanity. What they describe is a new and a unique lifestyle, rarely seen because it has been rarely tried. In fact, it was G.K. Chesterton who made that comment about Christianity. He said, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It, is bound it has been found difficult and not tried. And sadly, I would say that when we talk about Christianity, you have to begin really with the Beatitudes and their message because this is ground zero. We titled it a new way of seeing our life. And, and the reality is, it is different from any other aspect. And honestly, most of us, if not all of us, when we really come up against it, there's something that wants to pull back, not only because of the unfamiliarity, but because we inherently recognize there's something daunting, even in a spiritual sense, something deadly about following them completely. As I said, they they have a new way of seeing, a new way of thinking, a new way of living our life, radically apart from the rhythms and patterns of the world that we know. These are, quite honestly, the laws of the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of men. It's as if God is trying to say to us, if I were a man and I walked among you, this is how I would behave. I would, first of all, be humble, and I would be sorrowful, and I would be surrendered, and I would have a craving for God that could not be satiated. But most importantly, as we read today, I would come showing mercy rather than vengeance. You see, mercy is really the central link in the chain of godliness that's being described in the Sermon on the Mount. Without it, we cannot know God. There's no way to know God without His mercy. And without it, 
we would not be able to survive one another. That if there isn't a willingness for people to show mercy, all of us would be destroyed. You see, Jesus noted that the rules of this world are what we call justice-based. Uh, in Exodus 21, when he laid out his statutes for Israel, he gave the governing principle, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot, a burn for burn, wound for wound, wound bruise for bruise. It's the austerity of blind justice, punishment that is equal to the crime, it's an attempt to balance the score of life so that everything comes out fair and just. It's the kind of mindset that Teddy Roosevelt expressed when he said, you should speak softly but carry a big stick. You see, you and I have an inherent fear of looking like we're weak or vulnerable or pathetic. We don't want to look like we're prey but in the process, we often end up becoming like predators. Yet from the very beginning of God's revelation through His Word, it was not His power and His justice that He emphasized because that was apparent and evident. No one could miss it. All one has to do is look at the universe and realize that our God is a powerful God, not only to create, but to contain and maintain what goes on here. But it's His mercy that He speaks of most frequently and elevates and emphasizes again and again. For example, when the rebellious and unrepentant Adam and Eve are confronted with their sin, He still promises to send them a Redeemer who would break the serpent's grip and restore mankind to a right relationship with God. When Moses asks to see God's glory, God does not show him lightning and fire and thunder and earthquake, but it says he descended in the cloud and proclaimed his name, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Most people aren't aware that that is the most repeated statement in the entire Old Testament. That from Genesis to Revelation, it's mentioned over and over again that this is who our God is, beginning with this statement, I am the merciful and I am the gracious God. So that when God gave Israel the detailed instructions for the building of the tabernacle and later on the temple, the central feature was not the building or the altar or even the Ark of the Covenant, but it was the mercy seat that rested like a crown atop the Ark. The writer of Hebrews put it simply, this was the throne of grace the place where men receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Again and again, the emphasis becomes clear that God's glory is not seen in His power. It's not seen in His justice. It's not seen in His righteousness or His holiness. It's not seen in the expression of His power over the universe. His glory is seen in, of all things, the grace and mercy that He shows to people like you and me. Before God robed Himself in human flesh, He foresaw that our greatest need was not justice, but mercy. Justice is inherent in the universe. The Bible says a man will reap what he sows. There's ultimate justice that no matter how much one seems that they can get away with something, eventually, as Harvey Weinstein found out, it catches up with you. And as many others are finding it's catching up with them. No, justice is in the universe. It may not come in the time or necessarily the form that we want but as someone once said, the wheels of God's judgment roll very slowly, but when they catch you, they will grind you very finely. You will reap what you sow. 
What man did not need was just as he needed mercy. That's why Jesus himself said that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. In Matthew 9, he said that Jesus looked on the crowds, and Matthew said he had compassion upon them. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus himself said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And finally, as he confronted the Pharisees and their critical attitude, he said, Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy not sacrifice. Men who had turned giving sacrifices to God into a professional way of life were suddenly confronted by a God who said, I'm not really interested in the blood of bulls and goats. What I am interested is somehow I touch your life in such a way that you become a giver of mercy. Mercy is the whole reason for the cross. Writer of Paul says to the Ephesians in chapter 2, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Goes on, disobedient, gratifying the cravings of the sinful nature and following its desires and its thoughts. He says, by nature and, and by destiny, if you will, you were objects of wrath. That was the ultimate end of your day, that if justice is applied, you become the object of God's wrath. Yet, he goes on to tell us, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's notable that Paul bookends that whole statement with the same phrase, dead in transgressions, dead in transgressions. That anything that I have in my life is a consequence not of what I've done or accomplished, but it's his mercy that has blessed. So that we begin to understand hopefully that Mercy is both God's most glorious attribute, but it's also the lens through which he views the world around us. The lens through which he views you and me and every other person on the planet. And the writer of Ephesians tells us simply that in doing that, we might be to the praise of his glory. The praise of his glory in you is not what you've done, what you've accomplished. It's not how spiritual or religious or disciplined or anything else you might think is so important to God. The praise of his glory is how much mercy he has shown you. And the irony is the more I understand that I am an object of his mercy, that I am a grace case, means the more that he is glorified. The more he has to overcome in loving you, the greater his goodness and mercy shines in the universe. You see, what this should tell us is that if we're going to look anything like Jesus, we have to be merciful just like he is. And I find this hard to do because mercy is not something that's native to my nature. It doesn't come to me naturally. What comes to me naturally, first and foremost, is that sin reigns in my life, and sin really moves my life away from mercy. It turns me more into predator than it does anything else. Just for understanding, sin is the major enemy of mercy. You see, sin is more than a violation of a set of rules or a failure to observe a code of conduct. It's more than bad actions and wrong words or inappropriate behavior. Sin makes up its own rules. It's independent from God. It, it, it seeks to indulge every feeling. It seeks to satisfy every desire and meet every need, real or perceived. But most terribly, sin destroys relationships. It destroys my relationship vertically with God, and it destroys my relationship horizontally with others. And the most tragic thing is that sin is totally powerless 
to enable me to restore those relationships once they're broken. In fact, it has the opposite effect. It pushes me further and further away. And are not broken relationships the source of our greatest pain? And yet think about when you've had broken relationships. Has your first response to say, God, let me be merciful to those who have offended me or wounded me or betrayed me? Or is not our first response, I'm going to get even. I'm going to get vengeance. I'm going to show them how wrong they were and how badly they behaved. I think if you honestly weigh both of those choices out, you'll find that the side of vengeance is so much more heavily weighted and so much easier to go to. It's natural. It's natural. And when we read that God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay, <clears throat> we say, amen, Lord, can I watch? And we see it when we hear news that somebody that has done us wrong, whether real or perceived, nonetheless, they have done us wrong, and we hear that hardships and difficulties and problems come into our life, do not our minds immediately go, good. We may not verbalize it in polite company, but in our hearts are saying, well, good. They got their comeuppance. And God says, do you understand? That's not my heart. When he told the prophet Isaiah twice, he says, I find no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that they should turn from their sin. That God weeps when people get what they deserve. The saddest thing is that Jesus lived in a pharisaical world, and Pharisees both then and now believe that the way that you can gain God's mercy is by rule keeping. They see mercy, and I think many of us are guilty of this, myself included, of seeing mercy as more a theological concept, a, a reward from God that can be earned or gained by behaving in the right way, not even recognizing it is an unsolicited gift that is given and hopefully received but what they were central to them in Jesus' day was this idea that God wanted rule keeping. And this is why the Sermon on the Mount is, was written. In large part, Jesus wanted to emphasize that it was mercy, not rules, that was the key to God-likeness or holiness. Religious systems in general, but even Christianity as a whole, has stumbled over this over and over and over again has gotten derailed, if you will, in its effectiveness because we buy into the idea that it is our ability to keep the rules that makes God find us attractive, and God says it's not. It's my neediness for Him and my recognition of how much I need Him that is the thing that is most attractive. So that when He spoke to the Pharisees, he said to them in, in Matthew 5, 38, he says, you've heard it that was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven, that you might look like you're related to God. Because God loves the enemy. God seeks those who persecute him. He goes on to say he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. There are people who don't deserve to see another rising of the sun, and yet God will allow them to do so. He sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous that there are people who deserve to live in a denuded desert of lifelessness, and yet he will still allow the rain to fall on them. And then he adds, he says, if you love those who love you, which I do, I do, but what reward will you get? 
Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? But he says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we read that and we think to myself, well, the way you become perfect in this world is you keep all the rules. You follow all the guidelines. You do everything exactly the way the book says you're supposed to do it. And we've just lost the context of everything Jesus has just said to us. You see, the word perfect in the original there doesn't mean without flaw. It means completely satisfied. And what satisfies God is not rule keeping, it's mercy keeping. It's showing mercy that God says, if you want to be a perfect reflector of me, then become a merciful person. This is especially true because you and I, let's be honest, we're habitual, pervasive rule breakers. We're repeat offenders that if divine justice would be applied this moment, we would be locked up and the key would be thrown away. Because it's not just a matter of what we have done or even what we've said, but it's the thoughts that we've allowed to be entertained within the theater of our own minds that in and of themselves could condemn us. So that Jesus could say to the Pharisees, if you've lusted after a woman in your heart, have you not already essentially in your mind, in your heart, committed adultery? And are you not therefore guilty before God? He wasn't trying to create some new standard of behavior that we would strive to attain to so that we make sure that we never think the wrong thoughts. He was instead trying to show them the impossibility of ever fulfilling perfect righteousness in our own self. That's why Paul would write to the Galatians and say the law wasn't there to justify my behavior, it was there to reveal to me that I'm a sinner. To reveal to me that what I need first and foremost from God is mercy. Now we can fuse sometimes grace and mercy. They're, they're really kind of two sides of the same time, coin because we talk a lot about grace and so we should. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. It's a giftedness, a gift that you haven't earned. It's something that's given to you, a, a favor and a blessing upon your life that doesn't make sense if you're keeping score. And that's why grace frustrates some of us, because we're such avid scorekeepers. We're looking at the people around us and seeing their, their foibles and their flaws and their failings, and then we see the God, hand of God's blessing upon them, and we go, wait a minute, that's not fair. But that's the nature of grace. It's not fair. It's never been fair. And sadly, don't ever go say, God, give me justice. Oh my gosh, are you insane? But the other side of the coin is mercy, which means we don't receive what we do deserve. And in reality, that's where relationship with God begins. Not the cry of God, give me the gift of grace, but first and foremost, God, don't give me what I deserve. It was Jeremiah who said that it's only because of God's mercy that we are not consumed that his compassions don't fail. And then he added, they're new every morning because they have to be. I need new grace. I think morning is not enough. In fact, I need his mercy constantly. So that if I can find no other reason to be merciful, it's that I'm in constant and desperate need of it. And he says, I give mercy to those who are merciful. So if there's no other motivation in your life to be a merciful person, realize that that's the key to becoming the object of God's mercy, is being a merciful person. But there's something else besides sin that's native to my nature. It's called judging. I cannot not judge. Because in one sense, judge, judging is discriminating. I mean, in the sense that I 
realize that one is a woman and one is a man, one is tall and one is short, one is thin, one is healthy. You know, all these different dynamics that we look at in people's lives and separate them out into categories. We're told by the neurophysicists that, or neuropsychologists that we are always sorting and sifting and categorizing people into various niches just so that we can think in an organized fashion, although those divisions may not be actually real or scientific, but we do it just to organize our life. And you cannot help but do that. But where we get in trouble is when we begin to place values upon those various categories. And we say things like, well, you know what kind of person they are. That's why Paul said that the spiritual man makes judgments about all things. In a very real sense, mercy requires judgment. (laughs) Because to say that I have mercy without judgment is about as nonsensical as saying I love spaghetti but I can't stand noodles. I mean, it, it becomes a certain level of mere verbal flabbage. It is not mercy if judgment has not come forth. It's basically abdication of the truth. It's not being tolerant. It's a cowardice. A cowardice that simply conforms to the modem of the day. That's why when we read the Bible, we find that judgment and mercy are always mentioned together. When Micah the prophet spoke to Israel and he said, what does God require of you? And then he adds, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk faithfully with your God. As if Jesus was repeating that very statement, he later said in Matthew 23 to the Pharisees, the most important matters of the law you've overlooked. And what are those most important matters of the law? He again says, justice, which is truthfulness. Mercy and faithfulness. And that's why James, as we studied before, said, judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. But mercy triumphs over judgment. The danger is that we judge, we discern, and we say, look, here's what the Word says, and here is what you're doing in contradiction to it. That's truth. That's judgment, and that's important. But God says, if you just stay there and go around and become the truth detector that's always measuring where people are at and pointing out their errors, then you're going to find that you're going to come under that same dynamic. If you judge people without being merciful, you will be judged without mercy. No, these two have to be together. That I cannot overlook the fact that you're making choices and decisions that are self-destructive and are in violation of God's truth. But at the same time, God says to me, bring that truth with a heart of mercy. Because the merciful heart desires to restore, not simply to settle a score. It is, in fact, justice and truth that makes mercy mean something. When in the face of someone else's failure, God affords us the opportunity to show radical kindness to those who, from a legal point of view, don't deserve it. It's allowing a sinner to repent and experience the miracle of God's mercy and his grace. You see, the heart of the matter is is really this. The degree of mercy we show is exactly proportionate to the mercy we recognize that we have received. Have you noticed um, we are harshest with those whose sin we don't understand? We're harshest against people whose sins we don't understand. Let me take a chance at walking in a landmine here and and talk about some social issues, things like Black Lives Matter. I am a, a white man who's lived in a white world. 
it is really hard for me to understand why people who are black would march and talk about killing cops. Because I do know cops, and I do like them, and I realize they're people with family and so forth. But as my wife and I were talking about this the other day, I said, you know, quite honestly, I have no concept of what it's like to be treated differently because of the color of my sin. I, I, I don't know what it's like to be talked down to or given a, another opportunity or have doors blocked to me or be treated in a certain way just because of the color of my skin or something of that nature. I don't really understand what it, might, what it is like to be a black man living in an America. And so as a result, it's easy for me to sit down and say, why are you acting that way? And I'm not saying there aren't bad actors out there. There are always bad actors who take advantage of bad systems in order to pursue some other destructive or selfish agenda. I get all that. But you see, when we automatically just simply put people into a category and saying, you're a bad person because of what you're doing, we stop the conversation because mercy says, help me understand what you're talking about. And I think the problem's true on the other side, that many of those people have a jaundiced view of cops and the world they live in and what they have to deal with. Every time the, uh, an officer uses his weapon in the line of duty, you know, and automatically everything in the world falls down. The media begins to portray them as being wicked, evil executioners of people of colored skin. I think to myself, that is so wrong and so unfair. Because unless you've been in those situations, you have no idea the stress and the terror and, the, and how fearful. Every cop I've ever known said, I hope I never have to use my gun. I never have to shoot another person. I, that's the last thing in the world I ever want to have to do. And again, people who are angry don't have mercy upon that man. And because I'm more familiar with their world, every time I hear of an officer involved in a shooting, my heart immediately goes out to him and thinking, what must he or she be having to deal with right now? How much second guessing they must be going through. What, thinking to themselves, is there something I could have done? Did I react incorrectly? Did I make, make a mistake? Did I overreact? Was it panic? Was it fear? Or was it necessary? You see, we live in a world that wants everything to fit neatly into black or white categories, right or wrong categories, left or right categories progressive or, or conservative categories. We, we want to do everything so that we're sorting everything in these, and what we miss is in that we are giving ourselves permission not to be people who are showing mercy to other people. So we don't listen. We don't think about what it must be like to be literally in their skin. I remember talking to my old son one time and I asked him, I said, was it tough growing up a pastor's kid? He said, Dad, you'll never understand it. You never were one, and you'll never know what it was like. And I thought to myself, you're absolutely right. I've never been a pastor's kid. I have no idea what that's like. And then he began to explain to me the schizophrenia you lived with. He said, you know, we go to church and go to our Sunday school classes, and some teachers would let us get away with anything because we were the pastor's kid. And other people wouldn't let us get away with anything because we were the pastor's kid. We never knew what was coming next. <laughs> My son said, yeah, people say to me, so what's your dad like at home? I mean, really? <laughs> he said, I didn't quite follow what they're getting at. I said, he's dad? <laughs> but you, you know, again, I, that's a whole passage of life that I never knew and never experienced and was totally insensitized to. I never had mercy on my own kids going through that. And I'm sure you have your own story, an example that you can give. But you see, the mercy, the degree of mercy that we show is exactly proportionate to our realization of how much mercy has been shown to us. We are kindest to those who fall in ways that are familiar to us. 
So in a way, we might say, blessed are those who have been shown mercy because they're far more likely to be merciful. But sadly, that's not always the case. In fact, Jesus gives a great example in Matthew 18 of a man who owes him an insurmountable amount of money and he comes and says, have mercy upon me. And so the, his master says, I will have mercy and I will forgive your debt. And then he goes right out and turns around and finds somebody that owns him a pittance and he says, have mercy upon me. And he takes the man by the throat and said, I'm throwing you into prison until you paid everything. And Jesus' description of that man was, you wicked servant. And he said he turned him over to the torturers. What is the point he's making? Every one of us has been the object of incredible mercy. And every one of us have been graced by God by the very fact that we're sucking air right now, that we're not sitting in the cold, naked and hungry and exposed, under threat and in danger. What mercy God has shown me because when we begin to look at the great men and women that God used, you know what they were all very aware of? They were all deeply aware of how much mercy they had been shown. It's Isaiah saying, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. I, I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. In that moment as he beheld the glory of God, he says, I desire, deserve death. It was Luke when Jesus first performed the miracle of the fishes and Peter falls on his knees and says, depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. It's Paul who says, oh, wretched man that I am. You see, in those confessions of their own sinfulness, their own wretchedness, their own uncleanness, there was this realization that I have been the object of an unbelievable mercy, that God would have anything to do with me that God would have any interest or care for me. We all know about the Sisters of Mercy. That is, mercy has sisters. When we use words like love or compassion or forgiveness, we know those are the expressions, those are the, the twin triplets, if you will, of, of mercy, that they always are tied together. When there's mercy, there is love. Where there's mercy, there's compassion. Where there's mercy, there's forgiveness. There's no holding of grudges or, 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 or keeping a record of wrongs. Mercy moves past that, in, and it's because mercy at its core is humble. That's where, humil where mercy begins, in, a, in humility. Because humility is truthful and honest about ourselves. It's, a, it's an accurate appraisal of who I am. I do not deserve any of your mercies. How wonderfully and perfectly this is portrayed in the Gospel of John in the eighth chapter when a woman is brought to him <laughs> And those who bring this woman to Jesus and cast her on the ground in front of him declare the state of affairs. This woman was caught in the very act of adultery. And if that were enough, they weren't enough, they added, and the law is very clear. Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. But Jesus turned his focus of judgment away from the woman and he essentially held up a mirror to those who were accusing her. And he simply says, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone. John goes on to explain at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there always strikes me, the oldest left first. <laughs> Being older, I get it. <laughs> you live long enough and you will have a long enough list of regrets that you realize that any time you think about tossing a stone, you are living in a glass house. And it doesn't mean that we should therefore ignore the things that aren't right, 
but it means that we handle them differently and more graciously and more gently because we realize that a harsh and judgmental response can create oftentimes much more damage. It goes on to say, Jesus straightened up after the crowds had thinned. He stood up and he looked at the woman. He says, woman, has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you. And then he added, go now and leave your life of sin. This is an example of what James was talking about when he says, mercy rejoices over judgment. The judgment was there. She was un undoubtedly wrong. She was in sin. She was doing what God said, thou shalt not do. She was guilty of sin. There was no question about it. There was justice. But then God turns in the face of judgment and says, I don't condemn you. Mercy. You see, it's that awareness of my guilt before God that makes the mercy of God so powerful. At this moment when she is facing the reality of physical death because of her spiritual behavior, and suddenly death passes by and she's alive, and he says, I've decided to show you mercy. But then he added, Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus doesn't approve of her behavior, as some suggest today. She doesn't excuse her sin and saying, well, she's married to a rotten guy, and I can see probably she wanted to be loved, and maybe she was treated poorly as a child, and, you know, and get all to the psychobabble that we often get into and try to explain away instead of understand. I think there's a place for psychologizing the issue, to understand why people do, for us to even understand ourselves. Why do I behave this way? Why do I act? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but at some point we often say, therefore I'm no longer responsible, and God does not give you that permission. He says, regardless of what pushes you to the decisions and choices you make, you still bear the responsibility. And it's at that moment when I recognize that I'm responsible for what I've done and what I've said and how I behave that I fall before God and say, God, have mercy upon me. Forgive me for my sin. And God at that moment says, I forgive you, but even beyond that, leave your life of sin. It's almost as if he's saying, do you see where your behavior led you? Now, walk away from it so that you don't find yourself back here again. To not be what Peter said, the dog returns to his own vomit or the, the sow wallowing in her own mire, but rather to leave, to change, to walk away, to be able to recognize. But you have to understand it's only the grace and the mercy of God that enables us to do that. The purpose of mercy is not to even the score, it's to restore. Mercy looks at the sinner and says, what can I pray, what can I say, what can I do to restore this person? My wife read me this quote. She's a pretty avid reader, and she was reading something to me the other day, and it was such a great statement. I don't know if I'll get it quite right. Forgive me, honey, if I get it wrong. But the writer said something to the effect that when you forgive somebody for their sin, you release a prisoner from bondage and discover the prisoner is you. Long ago, God began to teach me and still continues to exercise me in this regard, but there are people in your life that whether it's real or just perceived, we won't argue those points, the merits of your case, but whether it's real or perceived, you feel like they've done you wrong, they've hurt you, they've failed you, they've betrayed you, whatever it is. And you find yourself grousing on the inside, grinding away. I first discovered it cutting the lawn. 
any kind of mindless activity that I engage in, suddenly this stuff percolates up into the surface of my life and suddenly I start thinking about how good they were there to go, but after all I've done and it's beautiful. You want to be inside my mind at that moment and just, be, just soak in that bile. And God in his wondrous grace said, just pray that I would bless them the way you want to be blessed. Because if they were being blessed, they wouldn't do what they do. If they knew the joy, they wouldn't be where they're at. They wouldn't say the things and act the way. Pray that I would just pour my blessings and my grace all over them. And then I suddenly realized, and as I'm praying for them, because I'm praying for them, all those things I'm asking God to do for them, he's going to do for me. It's not fair, but I take it. <laughs> See, the arrogant self-deception of the Pharisees what they, was that they thought that they were better, that they were more pure, more holy than the woman that they were condemning. And that's why Jesus said to them, <laughs> They were just as guilty, if not more so. He said, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. They didn't see the need to be restored. And so they weren't. The woman saw her need and was. And I come back lastly to the issue of broken relationships. Because so much of the mercy issues in our lives revolve around broken relationships, whether it's a personal relationship or it's a, 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 even a national dialogue that we're even having today in our country. That basically sin is powerless to restore broken relationships. Only mercy can do that. When we're estranged from someone else, the only thing that can mend that, that, that can change that dynamic is by somebody deciding, I am not going to be vengeful, I'm going to be merciful. I'm not going to try to correct the error or argue my, them into my position. I am going to simply be merciful. That I'm going to confess my sin and ask for their forgiveness. When I was on staff with Chuck Smith many decades ago now, I remember him talking, teaching on uh, training a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. And he started off the message, caught my interest almost immediately. He said, before I was married, I knew everything about raising kids. <laughs> then I got married and began to realize there's probably a couple things I could learn. We had our first child, and I realized that there were several things I didn't know about raising kids. And then our kids became teenagers, and I realized there's a ton of stuff I don't understand about raising kids. But he says, now that I'm a grandfather, I finally realized I know absolutely nothing about raising kids. <laughs> and I use that illustration, that story, because that's the way I feel about mercy after this week that I have been dealing with the issue of mercy. Let me tell you what I think. I think I know absolutely nothing about mercy. The more I look at myself and examine myself, I realize, God, I'm not all that merciful. That even in a moment where I am being merciful, I throw in, yeah, but. <laughs> and I realize there's this reservation that stands between my relationship with God and my relationship with other people. I know that mercy's hard for you because it's hard for me. You live long enough, you're going to find more than enough reasons to not be merciful to an increasing number of people in your life whether intentionally or just the function of their own stupidity, have done things that have harmed you and cost you. But we have to remember, first of all, that justice has its own pace and it's there, 
Men do reap what they sow. The chickens do come home to roost. Can't think of any other metaphor, so I'll stop. But, <laughs> but it's just a fact of life. You just have to live long enough to see it. But in the end of the day, the thing that you yearn for more than everything, anything else is intimate relationships. And it begins with my relationship with God that if I'm unmerciful, I'm not really understanding or appreciating what God has done for me and the mercy he's shown me that I really do deserve to be fried. But God had mercy upon me. And I began to think deeply about things that I did even before I was a Christian and I suddenly recognized I was not a nice person. As much as you would ask me, say, I'm basically a good guy. No, I wasn't. I was selfish and predatorial. Sociopathic, maybe. And God had mercy on me. There's a, there's a depth of that realization that not only is painful to own, but is also powerfully healing. that I stand before God, not because of anything I have done, that I know that when I close my eyes in death, I will be in the presence of God, not because of anything I have done or anything I didn't do. It's gonna be all about his mercy. His love was so great that he showed me mercy, and he not only showed me mercy, he gave me grace, gifting that I don't deserve. Father, I pray that you'd help us, help me to grasp this concept of mercy, Lord. It is, as David said of some things, that there are thoughts sometimes that are too wonderful for us, they, that our minds can never really grasp. Or, but Lord, we pray that you at least let us learn how to eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Help us to understand the crumbs of your mercy, Lord, in hopes that someday we'll be able to eat the loaf. But in the end, Lord, we know that we can never look like you in this world. We can never truly bear your image until we learn how to be merciful. That we don't turn our brains off to things that are wrong we don't blind ourselves to injustice and pretend like everything's wonderful. But also, Lord, that we're not about keeping score or settling scores. Our goal is, Lord, to restore people into right relationship with you. Help us to be that, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name.